Okay. Do this. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, we're going to wait maybe one or two more minutes for last couple participants to trickle in, and then we'll get started. Cool, that's about two minutes past. So why don't we get started and then people can still filter in and they'll catch up as they are able. So um, hello everybody, um, good to see everyone here. Uh, my name's Ian, I'm a postdoc at Michigan and um, I'm one of the co-hosts for the series. And um, <laughs> today we are uh, looking forward to hearing about causal inference from uh, Dr. Ahmad Manzoor, who is a professor at University of uh, Wisconsin. Um, who has done a lot of work in causal inference. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop talking and let him take it away. So Ahmad, uh, do you want to get started? Yeah, yeah. Let me just uh, close a bunch of tabs causing noise. All right, so now this should work. <coughs> All right, just to check, uh, can, can everyone see the screen and can they see my transitions? I, I've pinned my video, so let me just. Yeah, you're on the first slide now, but I think I saw it transition. Okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Check switch. All right. Uh, so I'm super excited to be here, and thanks for inviting me to give this tutorial. Uh, so today, what we're going to be doing is talking about controlling for text and causal inference. Uh, the outline of this tutorial is going to be I'll first start talking about. Uh, a I'll give you a primer to causal inference. We'll talk about things like um, in individual treatment effects, average treatment effects, counterfactuals, and that kind of stuff. So just to be a basic introduction for you to follow this tutorial. Then we look at uh, inferring causal, inf uh, establishing causal relationships without having randomized experiments. Uh, so there's some issues with doing that, and we'll discuss what those issues are and how we can try to get around them. Then we'll move on to text as a control, which is the, the sort of focus of this presentation. And I'll give you a brief, very high level overview of double machine learning. So that's the statistical technique. It's a very general statistical technique that lets you embed machine learning models in, uh, in a causal inference task. Uh, I'm going to be using that to control for text. So I'll just give you a high level overview of what that, what that framework provides. And then I'll give you pointers to next steps from this tutorial. So once you know, uh, once you get a glimpse of this material here, where can you jump to to find um, um, more information or more applications, more interesting problems to solve? All right. So what is causal inference? Hey, guess what? Yeah. Because the meeting just now is canceled, I get to attend the natural language processing webinar. Yeah. Oh, Emily, I think you're, you're unmuted, so I'm going to mute no, you. I'm... <laughs> All right. Let me just, I'm just going to minimize the thumbnails. Uh, if anyone has a question, just unmute yourself and interrupt me because I can't see you on the screen. All right. So what is causal inference? Causal inference is, in general, it's the process of doing two things. Uh, you establish 
causal relationships, which means you claim that the, there is a cause and effect relationship and defend it uh, and prove that it, it exists. And the second step is quantifying that causal relationship. Uh, how strong is it? And what is the confidence interval around the strength uh, using statistics and data? So that's uh, what causal inference is in a nutshell. And it's a, it's a challenge that spans across disciplines. So if, you, if you're interested in whether a phone call leads to someone voting, or if, uh, if an ad makes people click on things on your website, um, or if an email that you receive uh, about some promotion leads you to buy a product, or, or if some kind of uh, payment scheme actually leads people to wearing masks more, uh, more often than not. All of these are causal questions that are spanning different domains, um, public health, e-commerce, computational advertising, uh, communication, and all of them, all of these causal problems have the same set of underlying challenges and uh, solutions. So this is, um, the study of causality is something that a lot of people in many different communities are interested in. And as a result, you see, when you, when you look at different uh, areas of the literature, you'll see different ways of solving the causal problems in that literature. So the, the, the information I'm gonna give you now is my perspective on causal inference. It's, sort of, it's um, influenced by my training uh, in a public policy and economics uh, department. But you, you, you'll, you might come across different ways of thinking about it from epidemiolo epidemiologists, uh, statisticians, and uh, other people interested in this topic. All right, so what is a causal effect? The typical setup in causal inference is you have an individual. You think of this as your focal individual. The individual is given a treatment. Um, I'm going to call that treatment A. And that A is from among a set of possible actions. So the set of possible actions could be something like a vaccine or a placebo. So that's two actions that the, the treatment could take on. And the person is, and each individual is either given a treatment or given a placebo. Um, they can uh, or give, either given a vaccine or given a placebo. They can't be given both. Right? So that's where a treatment is. Once you give the treatment, you measure some uh, something about this individual, and that is called the outcome. Maybe you measure their uh, blood pressure, or you measure um, how they're feeling after the treatment, or maybe you take one week and then follow up and ask them. Are you having any side effects? Uh, did it have a positive effect or a negative effect? So the, the outcome is something that you observe after you're given uh, the treatment. Right? So these are the three, co three components of uh, a causal inference setup, the treatment, the outcome, and the focal individual. Now let's talk about something called a causal estimate. An estimate is what, you're, what is the effect that you're trying to estimate from your causal setup. And the simplest type of estimate you can think of is called the IPE, the individual treatment effect. So what is the individual treatment effect? To, to define the IPE, I need to introduce two new concepts. Uh, one is uh, this Y here, the outcome Y. I'm going to, this is an observed outcome. So this is something that uh, that happens in the real world and I see it and I make note of it. So it's an observed uh, value. These Y's over here, the Y with the superscript, are called counterfactuals. So Y superscript A equals one is what would the outcome have been had the individual been vaccinated? So when treatment status is one, when treatment status is vaccinated, what would the outcome have been? And Y with superscript A equals zero is what would the outcome have been if the individual had been given the placebo? And when I say these are counterfactuals, I'm distinguishing them from what I actually observe. When, if you take an individual and vaccinate them, then Y superscript A equals one, the counterfactual will be equal to Y without any superscripts. So in that case, the Counterfactual Y superscript A equals one is equal to the observed outcome. But then Y superscript A equals zero is not observed. And this is, a, uh, this is the fundamental problem of causal inference. For any given individual, you can only observe one of their counterfactual outcomes. And that's the outcome that corresponds to 
the treatment uh, that they're given. Uh, so, but let's suspend uh, disbelief for a while and let's assume that you have a table uh, on the right where you have a bunch of patient names and for each patient, you magically find out if I gave them a treatment, uh, this would have been the outcome. And if I did not, if I, gave, if I gave them a control, if I gave them a placebo, this would be the outcome. I can construct a table of these magical uh, observa counterfactual observations. And then I can measure for each individual what is their individual treatment effect. And that's basically what their outcome had they been given treatment minus their outcome had they been given, um, the, not had they not been given treatment. And I can measure this for every individual, and that's why it's called the individual treatment effect. So the issue with this uh, ITE, which I which I just mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, is you can't actually measure this from observable data. And the reason is that when the individual is vaccinated, then your counterfactual y superscript a equals one is equal to the observed outcome. But then why superscript A equals zero is unknown. You have no idea what would have happened if you had not vaccinated this individual. Similarly, if you had not given, you decided not to treat the individual, you gave the individual a placebo, you have no idea what would have happened if you went back in time and gave them the treatment instead. Um, so both counterfactuals for A equals one, A equals zero are never observable simultaneously, which means that there's no way that you can actually measure this from observable data. And that's what people in causal inference mean when they say something cannot be identified. Identify This map identified to measured from observable data. So that, that was the um, ITE. And now we're gonna talk about a different estimate for which we have some, some hope of identifying it or measuring it from observable data. All right, so let's, um, let me, I'll just pause for a bit, uh, for a minute now. Uh, do, do people have any questions about the basic causal inference setup or uh, the ITE causal estimate? You can unmute yourself and just ask a question in the chat. Um, okay, it's not a question. All right. So now let's let's uh, look at can we can we try to do, uh, measure, come up with an estimate that we can actually um, estimate from data, and the estimate that we're going to look at is called the average treatment effect. In this setup, we assume that we have n individuals um, from individual i from index from one to n. For every individual, there is a treatment status, uh, a cap uh, capital A subscript I, and there's an outcome that you measure, uh, capital Y subscript one. So you can imagine that you have maybe 100 patients in a hospital, uh, and for um, some of them, you've given the treatment, and some of them, you've not given the treatment. And for each of them, you've observed the outcome. The ATE is defined as follows. For every individual, again, you have two counterfactual outcomes, whether the outcome had they been vaccinated and the outcome had they been given the placebo. And those are the two, um, uh, the two counterfactual, the two subscript Y values that you're seeing here. I can use these counterfactuals to define what is my average treatment effect. And the average treatment effect is defined as what is the average value of the outcome? So the average over all individuals had they been um, given the treatment minus what is the average value of the outcome over all these individuals had they been given the uh, had they been given the placebo then not been given the treatment and this gives me a little some hope of estimation if, if let's say i have data that's um, that looks like something on the right so you have names for every individual you have their treatment status that's capital a 0 or 1 and you have their outcome so one way you could think of measuring the average treatment effect is I'm going to measure the outcome for all treated individuals and I'm going to take the average. So that gives me the left-hand side of my, uh, the left term of my ATE. And then I'm going to measure the outcome for all individuals who are not treated. And so 
what is the outcome for treated individuals? What is the outcome, average outcome for untreated individuals? And then subtract those two averages. This is easy to do, but is the ATE actually equal to the difference of these two observable terms? And the answer is that it's not always, that, e that equivalence is not always true. And I'll, I'll motivate why, why with uh, an example. So let's say you're, you, there's a situation where you have patients who are either admitted to ICUs or not admitted to ICUs. Uh, so th that's the treatment, A equals one if you're admitted to the ICU. And you have an outcome, which is the patient survival. If the patient dies, your outcome is one. And if your patient survives, your outcome is zero. And let's say I've I look at a whole bunch of patients and I count how many people were admitted and how many people died. And this is the table I come up with. I find that um, there were 100 patients who were admitted to the ICU and who did not survive. There were 25 patients who were admitted to the ICU and survived. There were 10 patients who were admitted, not admitted to the ICU and who died. And there were 1,000 patients who were not submitted to the ICU and did not survive. And now let's say I use this equation here, the equation at the bottom. Um, the average of treatment and control to figure out does ICU admission cause death. If I if I go ahead and do that, what I'm going to do now is measure the average, the probability of death given that you're admitted to the ICU, and the probability of um, death given that you're not admitted to the ICU. And just looking at these numbers, what what you what we get is uh, the probability of death if you're admitted to the ICU is 75 percent and the probability of death if you were not admitted to the ICU is 10 percent and if I take the subtraction what this is tell what the subtraction is telling me is um, if I if I assume this is a causal effect it's telling me that going to an ICU increases my chances of dying by um, 65 percent 65 percentage points um and this it doesn't intuitively doesn't make sense right so you, why would going to the icu mean you're just more likely to die because you went to the icu so what is the what is the problem here uh, if, if anyone wants to take a guess wh what's the problem with just taking a subtraction of these two survival rates and assuming that that's the causal effect You can leave a guess in the chat if you have any. Yeah, because we have a confounder variable of uh, being already very ill if they send you to the uh, intensive care unit. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's a great answer. So I won't say the word confounder yet because I want to introduce it. But yeah, so people who are admitted to ICUs are already sick. There's a reason why they're sent to the ICU. So they already have a low survival rate um, so they're more likely to not survive. Uh, you could also, so that the previous health status is something that could be affecting the treatment. So the previous health status determines whether you're admitted to the ICU and the previous health status also determines whether you survive or not. So you, there is this factor that's affecting both the treatment and the outcome. Another factor that could come into play here is the patient's age. So if a patient is old, um, and they are just they they fall ill. Um, people the, they, they are less likely to survive, so they get admitted to the ICU. And if a patient is old, um, it also affects their probability of survival. So age is something that affects both admission ad, admittance to the ICU and probability of survival, the treatment and the outcome. And there's something to keep in mind um, that there are these two factors that are giving us this spurious uh, causal effect. Uh, and both of these factors affect the treatment and the outcome. So that's the that's the definition of a confounder. A confounder is a factor that could be observed, it could be unobserved, which biases your causal effect towards something that it's not. So what we measured by just taking the average difference in outcomes between treated and control, that's just an association without making further assumptions. 
And an association is not equal to causation when you have this kind of confounding. Uh, the key thing to keep in mind is confounders are always factors that are common causes of both the treatment and the outcome. They need not cause the treatment and outcome directly. Maybe there's a long sequence of uh, relationships and a confounder could indirectly cause a treatment and indirectly cause an outcome. Um, but they're still confounded. In, you might think, okay, age is a confounder. I'm just going to measure the person's age. I'm going to ask for their medical history and I'm going to uh, control for it. Or maybe what I'm going to do is instead of measuring the average survival rate for treated and control, I'm going to split the patients by age into different buckets. And within each bucket, I will measure the difference between ICU patients and non-ICU patients. So that way I measure for old people separately and for young people separately. And that'll give me two treatment effects for old people and young people, but they both each of those treatment effects will be um, unbiased because I'm controlling for age. The issue with, with this uh, logic is in general, con your confounders are going to be unobserved. There's a lot of stuff happening in the world that um, might confound your estimates, your, your causal effects, and you can't control for everything. So, um, Let's, let's, let's now look at a simulation of uh, confounding. Let me switch to the OLAB notebook. Um, and if, if you have a link to this, you can, you can follow along or you can just look at, look at my screen. Right. So this is the, the first two cells are just importing, in, installing some packages and importing uh, sorry. packages. I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't think we sent the link, so I can do that right now in the chat, so that way everyone can open it up. So let me Oh, do yeah. That. Yeah. All right, I'm sending it now. So now if you click that link, you should be able to see the uh, notebook that Ahmad is looking at. All right, so for now, let me just, uh, you don't need to look at the um, look at the code. I'll just tell you what the setup that I'm, uh, I'm gonna work with is. <clears throat> what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna simulate a, a causal inference setting where there's a confounder. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get documents from uh, this data set called 20 news groups. Uh, so it's a text-based document. Uh, each uh, document is in, yeah, each document is an email and uh, there's a label for each email, which is which news group it's coming from. Um, so, and there are 20 of those news groups. So like some examples of news groups are computer graphics, um, PC hardware, autos, uh, things like that, religion and so on. Um, and I'm just, instead of using 20 news groups, I'm just gonna collapse them into a set of smaller 10 news groups. I'm gonna put all the computer-based news groups as one label, uh, the creation base as one um, and so on. So I'm just gonna collapse them manually into 10. So, and so now I have this data of um, 10,000 documents with some label associated with them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate data, which looks, um, which looks like this. So this is, um, this is going to be a linear model of some outcome. So I'm gonna, let's say my outcome is Y and Y is going to depend on two things. It's going to, I'm just gonna add a constant and it's I'm going to um, it's going to depend on some 0.05 times some 
value z, which is generated. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you how z is generated, and five times some other value u. This is just a, it's a, it's a sort of a fake data generating process. And plus, I've added some sort of noise, some random noise, just to add some variability to the outcome. So what this is going to give me eventually is some table which has three columns: y, z, and u. Y is the outcome. Z is uh, the treatment in in this setting, and U is going to be my unobserved confounder. So that's the notation that I'm using in the simulation. And remember that for U to be a confounder, it has to affect both the treatment and the outcome, right? And that's why I have this. Um, this line in my simulation here, what this line is saying is, I want when I generate my treatment, when I simulate my treatment values, I want them to be some function of my unobserved confounder with some random noise. So now this, because of this line, my treatment depends on the confounder. And because of this line, my outcome also depends on the confounder. So Y is my outcome, Z is my treatment, and use my confounder. Uh, and that's how my simulated data is generated. And now let me tell you what the confounder is. My confounder is basically whether the, and there's gonna be one line of um, the simulated data for every document in my data set. The way my confounder is generated is if that document came from a religious news group, then my confounder value is going to be one. And otherwise my confounder value is going to be zero. So it's a binary confounder that depends on the topic of the, um, uh, the document. And finally, my simulated data is going to have these three columns, the treatment, the unobserved confounder, and uh, the treatment, the, uh, the outcome, and the unobserved confounder. And I'm also going to put in uh, a bag of words representation of this document. So that's something that I guess you've seen in the previous tutorials. It's uh, think of it as uh, just a, a long vector for each document uh, that has a word count of uh, some function of the word counts. Right here, right now, I'm using the tfidf uh, function of the words counts. But what what's actually inside this vector is not relevant right now. Uh, this is basically the structure of my simulated data. All right. So something to keep in mind here is the true effect size here is 0 0.05. So what this model is telling me is if I increase Z, if I increase the treatment from 0 to 1, or if I increase it by 1 unit, my outcome will change by 0 0.05 on average. It won't change exactly by 0 0.05, but on average, it'll be 0 0.05. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simulate this data. So if you run the cell, it should give you the simulated data and make sure you run uh, the cells above. The cells above are just um, some sort of text processing steps that we can skip for now. And then let's look at what my simulated data looks like. I'm going to put it into a data frame and you can see that I have around close to 10,000 documents. Oops. I guess I need, I need to run this um, from scratch. Shouldn't take too long. I think the kernel might have shut down. Might not have another copy of this.
All right, so let me just skip this. Um, installing the last package. I don't need it right now. And I don't need double ML right now. Let me just right now get the other packages. Um, get my 20 news group data data. And then let me simulate it and then let me print out my data frame. All right. So if you look at my data frame now, it has the outcome which is some, some real number. It has a treatment, which is some real number. And it has the binary confounder, which is zero or one. And then it has these uh, numbers, the TF-IDF values for every word. And this is some, some high dimensional vector. And I can also describe what this looks like. Um, so my outcome is between some, it has a mean of uh, 0.98. And um, you can see that there's a, it has some range. Uh, the important thing to note here is that the confounder is binary, and you can see that in the minimum and the maximum values. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna estimate the treatment effect assuming that there are no confounders, uh, no unobserved confounders. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run a linear regression of my outcome on my treatment and the unobserved confounder. I'm going to regress y on z and u. So let me first get my y values, which is the first column of um, this data set. Then let me get my uh, z and u values. So that's columns um, one and two. And then I'm going to add a constant because I'm, I need to do that to run my regression. And then I just use the stats models library to um, run my linear regression. You can go ahead and run this and you'll see the estimated effects for Z and U. And what I care about is this. And you can see that this has a coefficient of 0 0.0501. 0 it's close to the true value, but more importantly, the confidence intervals overlap the actual treatment effect. So confidence interval, it's a pretty precise. It's between 0 0.050 and I guess the precision of these numbers is uh, not high enough, but you, you can see that if I just run linear regression and I have my unobserved confounder, I can estimate my treatment effect without any bias. But what happens if I drop U? So I'm now what I'm, the, in the next regression, I'm going to regress my outcome on my treatment only. So now you can see that it's only column um, one, uh, column zero and column one. I'm gonna run my regression and then I'm gonna look at what is my treatment effect? And now my treatment effect is, it's, um, it's, it's, it's biased. So it's not close to 0 0.05. And you can see that the confidence intervals don't overlap the actual treatment effect. Uh, so this is an example of where omitting that unobserved confounder U caused a bias in my treatment effect estimation. Right, so now um, let's switch back to uh, the slides. So before switching back, any questions about the demo we've seen so far? To social scientists in the group, could you control for correlated errors in these models? Yes. So um, what I'm not talking about in this tutorial at all is in, is uh, inference. So I'm not going to talk about um, how do you actually come up with these confidence intervals and standard errors. Uh, but yes, in OLS, you can control for correlated errors. Um, in the the code that I've written, I am not uh, assuming there's any error correlation, uh, but that's not the it's not going to help in this case um, because you you have an unobserved confounder, your estimates will be biased whether you control for correlated errors or not. Is that does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so any, anything else? 
Okay, so let me move on to the next part of this slide. This is all, we're still in the part of um, the primer and causal inference. That's so why I'll, I'll move a little quick because it seems like most of you are aware of uh, these issues. So if the, the gold standard to get rid of confounding is randomization. So what you would do is you would randomly assign individuals to treatment actions. You randomly pick uh, individual 50% of your patients, give them the vaccine, 50% give them a placebo. And when you do this, um, your counterfactual value, this uh, expected value of Y superscript uh, AI is going to be equal to your observed conditional value. And the way that's formalized is using this equation in the box. Um, the randomization solves issues of confounding. Even if your confounders are unobserved, it's, it's fine. You just have to randomize and you're done. The issue is it's, uh, it's often expensive and it's often infeasible and in unethical. So you can't, for example, you can't randomly send patients to an ICU because ICUs have limited capacity. Other people might need it. You can't just run an experiment on humans and ICUs. What people do instead is try to come up with causal inferences using observational data. And one way to do this is to control for or condition on all unobserved confounders. In the example of patients admitted to ICUs, if I know that if I can measure people's age, then I can bucket them by their age and measure the average treatment effect in each bucket separately. And then I can take the average over those bucket specific effects. Um, this is fine if you believe the very strong assumption that all your confounders are observed, but in general, your confounders, they're gonna be unobserved confounders. Uh, a strategy that comes midway between assuming no unobserved confounders and running an experiment is something called quasi-experiment. So you can use na uh, these are natural experiments or quasi-experiments along with controlling for unobserved confounders. Uh, this is uh, sort of an art in, in causal inference. And I'll give you an example of a quasi-experiment that I recently found out uh, about. Um, this is by um, uh, Yakub at uh, USC, uh, Marshall, at the Marshall School of Business. So they were interested in looking at what is the effect of Airbnb making you a super host on your booking rates? Uh, does it um, improve your booking rates or is there, like, is there no effect? Um, if I simply looked at booking rates of um, super hosts and non-super hosts and looked at the difference, the booking rates of super hosts would be higher because maybe people who are good hosts, they get high booking rates, they get high ratings and they become a super host and that's why the rating is high. So maybe they have, maybe super host status does not have any effect. It's Maybe it's just that uh, these hosts were already good and receiving high booking rates because of that. Uh, so you can't simply compare super host booking rates with non-super host booking rates. You need to be able to take every super host and compare that super host with um, another host that is identical, but not a super host. Um, which is not possible in practice. Like you need to somehow go back in time and remove the super host status, uh, or you need to do randomization. So how do we find for every super host, how do we find that control host that is not a super host? The natural experiment that uh, Yakub and co-authors came up with is uh, they use the fact that to get super host status, you need to have an average rating of at least 4.8. So their logic was that if I look at all hosts that have a rating of 4.8 and they are super hosts, and I look at all hosts who have a rating of 4.75, who are not super hosts just because they didn't clear this arbitrary cutoff. Um, I'm going to compare these two. And my assumption is that the treatment and control group, the hosts are going to be of the same quality. The only reason they are not being given super hosts is because they didn't clear this arbitrary cutoff of 4.8. And that's the argument that they make. And then they, con they compare the booking rates of super hosts and non-super hosts only in the small range of around the threshold of 4.8. And that's called a regression discontinuity design. Uh, there's some other strategies that you can use. Um, one example, one, two examples are difference in differences and instrumental variables. Uh, but in general, coming up with these sort of um, 
national experiments is uh, it's a bit of an art uh, it's a bit of an art people also use controls in randomized experiments and one reason why you might want to do that is to improve the precision of your treatment effects so if you want smaller confidence intervals uh, you typically throw in some kind of controls in your uh, randomized experiment um, in some cases there is something called conditional randomization where you're not randomizing uh, overall but maybe you're randomizing based within genders or within age groups that's called conditional randomization um, so on, on overall the treatment assignment is not random but once you fix a person's age or a person's gender within that bucket the treatment assignment is random and that's called conditional randomization and the way you would write down that conditional randomization um, equation is uh, is in this box here and you can see this new term has showed up called uh, xi which is some some scalar or a vector of controls for individual i and that is showing up in the uh, uh, conditional expectations on both sides so controls uh, the bottom line is controls are used in experiments. Uh, controls are used when you assume no one observes confounding, and controls are used in even in the case of quasi experiments. There are now what I'm going to jump to is there are many situations where you want to control for text. So let me give you a, an example of one of such situation. Let's say you have a, a, a conference that has um, peer review and um, you're interested in whether having a theorem in the paper would improve its review rating. And the setup is as follows. Every, uh, there, there's a recommendation system which matches papers to reviewers, which takes as input reviewer preferences and paper topics. So this, this is actually what happens in real world reviewing. Um, and the paper topics are derived from the text of the paper or keywords or something like that. The recommendation takes this input and then assigns for every reviewer a bunch of uh, papers to review. In this case, my treatment is for every paper J, my treatment is binary. It's whether the paper has a theorem or not. And the outcome is going to be whether for every reviewer I and paper J, whether the rating, uh, I mean, the outcome is going to be the rating of the review. So it's a number between one and five. And what I'm interested in is if I change my treatment from zero to one, if I add a theorem, then um, would the rating have increased? So that's the causal question I have in mind. Uh, the target estimate that I'm going for here is the ATE. And the way I would write that is the expected value of the rating. Um, and this is for a given review. It's not over all reviews. The expected value of the rating of review I had the paper contained a theorem minus the expected value of the rating had the paper not contained a theorem. And the expectation here is over all papers. It's not over all reviewers. And so how do I, how do I go and measure this? So is, is, there, is there randomization happening in this setting? In overall, there is, there is no randomization because papers are assigned to reviewers. For, for a given reviewer, the, the paper that is assigned depends on the topic of the paper. So if I, if I tell you that my reviewer is interested in uh, theoretical topics, maybe in uh, machine learning complexity or something, it's more likely that this reviewer is assigned papers on machine learning complexity topics and less likely that the reviewer is assigned papers on uh, national language processing. Right? So papers are not equally likely to be assigned to this reviewer. And because this reviewer likes theoretical papers, this reviewer probably would um, assign higher ratings for uh, papers with theorems than papers without theorems. Or would, would, my, would this reviewer might assign lower ratings for papers in NLP uh, because they're unsure. Maybe they mostly give neutral ratings because they're unsure of how to evaluate it. So the topic of the paper here is affecting both, uh, both the treatment. Some topics are theoretical, some topics are not, and it's affecting the outcome, which is the review rating. Um, so that this uh, this situation is not random. It's not it's not unconditionally random. And the way I would write that is using this equation in the box. But if I fix for a, for a given reviewer, if I fix a topic and look at all the papers that the reviewers assigned in that topic, then any paper is equally likely to be assigned. 
if I fix the topic as complexity theory, um, which paper I'm going to pick from complexity theory and give to the reviewer, that's going to be at random. And that's uh, because of the way the system is set up. It, the recommendation system depends only on the paper topics and the reviewer preferences. So this conditional randomization, which means that when I, if, I run an, if I measure my treatment effects, I need to control for the paper topic. But because the paper topic is, uh, it's basically a function of the paper text, I can instead control for the paper text. And that will give me my treatment effect estimates. So this is one situation where controlling for text uh, is required. Uh, some other examples are, uh, there's a paper that I have on using a quasi-experiment to figure out the effect of reputation on persuasion. Um, and in that, uh, I need to control for the argument text. Uh, and there's a nice survey by Katie on text and causal inference of it, uh, when text is a confounder, so, and which has a lot of other examples. Um, the issue here, let's see how much time I have. Uh, I should be done in another five minutes. The issue here with controlling for text is conceptually, it, it makes sense. Like it's just it, the way I control for you in my regression, uh, I want to be able to just add text to my regression. But the issue here is how do I actually do this in practice? Like do I, uh, if text is inherently high dimensional and unstructured. So I need to structure it somehow and put it in my regression. And there are many ways of doing this. There are many ad hoc ways of doing this. I can use topic modeling and get a topic low dimensional representation of the text. I can use embeddings. I can hand code features. The issues with these ad hoc methods is um, uh, the, the three main issues. One is there's no guarantee that the confounders are retained in this low dimensional representation. And that's because when you construct the low dimensional representation, you're not actually trying to retain confounders. Uh, you're just, you may be trying to maintain interpretability or do something else, but so when you go from high dimensional to low dimensional, so the actual confounders in the text might disappear. The second issue is that it's brittle. So each of these different methods comes up with a different representation um, and then you get different causal estimates depending on what representation you use and you don't know which one to trust. Uh, so that's, that's issue number two. Issue number three is that when you later con construct confidence intervals, in general, confidence intervals don't care about the fact that they assume that your text representation is not derived from some machine learning process. Uh, they assume that it's given to you, like it's something, some measurement that you got from the data, like a patient's blood pressure or something. But now if you're, if you're deriving um, a low dimensional representation from the data and then plugging it into your regression, your confidence intervals are going to be invalid. So let's, um, let, this, is, this is not something that we're actually gonna run, but I've given you the code to regress the outcome on the treatment and on this high dimensional bag of words vector for the text. And if you run this, uh, first of all, it's gonna take long. It may not even finish running. Uh, secondly, the effect, um, the effect sizes that you're gonna get are probably gonna be way off because of, it's very hard for a high dimensional regression to converge. So, so the first attempt is not going to work. The second attempt, which uh, I'm going to show you now is Let's, let's uh, regress the outcome on the, on the treatment and on topics. So I'm gonna take my text and I'm gonna uh, use non-negative matrix factorization to construct uh, topics of the text. Right. So let's um, switch to the collab. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm creating a non-negative topic model, uh, a non-negative matrix factorization model I'm setting the number of topics as 50, and I am running topic modeling on my bag of words vectors. And if I print out the topics, you can see that I get topics that kind of make sense. There's this topic that's about monitors, this topic that's about space flight, um, and things like that. And my expectation is that one of these topics will, or some of these topics will capture religion. So this topic captures religion. Um, and I guess that's the only one. Yeah, that's the only topic that captures religion. And my hope is that if I control for the weight of each topic in each document, um, then maybe I, I'm controlling for my unobserved confounder, which is, is this document from a religious uh, news group? But it turns out that if I, when I do, when I run my regression, I, 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 again, I get the outcome and then I get 
uh, the treatment the, and along with the topic weights. So I'm stacking these together. Um, and then I run my regression. My, and this is my treatment effect estimate. So you can see that the bias has reduced. It's gone from 0.9 to 0.7. It's closer to uh, 0.09 to 0.07. It's closer to 0 0.05. Uh, and the confidence intervals are also pretty close. It's like just missing 0 0.05, but it's still not there. And the reason is that um, maybe the topic modeling is not good enough. So something you can do later uh, after this tutorial is you can try to change the number of topics, maybe reduce it, maybe increase it, maybe use LDA and try to see if you can actually get this bias down and make the confidence intervals overlap the true effect. Um, but it's hard. It's, uh, and it's, you know, uh, so right, right now we, get, we can actually check whether we are capturing the true effect, but in practice, you don't know the true effect. So how are you going to tune your um, topic models? This is, and this is what motivates my um, final approach, which is double machine learning. And I'm going to give you um, a high level intuition of what it's doing. And then I'll just show you a quick code demonstration. So the high level intuition is that the, uh, so the, the, what I'm drawing here is something called a directed acyclic graph. And it's a very simple depiction of causality. Uh, and Arrow basically says that there is a cause, there's possibly a causal relationship between two things. And the lack of an arrow means that there is no causality. So what I'm drawing here is a treatment and outcome. And I'm drawing a confounder, which affects the treat come, which affects the treatment and which affects the outcome, but it only affects the outcome through the text. So this is a more general situation where you have both the text as a confounder. So the text affects the treatment through this. And this confounder is unobserved. I, I should have mentioned that. So this is an unobserved confounder. Um, so I have this confounding situation going on and I'm interested in controlling for the text. If I control for the text, I'm going to block the path between the confounder and the outcome. And that makes it no longer a confounder because my confounder needs to affect both the treatment and the outcome. You can think of the text as four logical components. Component A is affected by both the confounder and the outcome. Component B is not affected by anything. Component C is only affected by the confounder and component B is only affected by, only affects the outcome. And what you need to somehow find and control for is component A. And that's what dimensionality reduction is trying to do. It's trying to somehow take this big blob of text and extract A from it and then put it in the regression. But the problem is that's, that's a very difficult problem. That's like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, so what we are going to do instead with double machine learning is I'm going to measure the strength of these arrows. I'm going to measure how strongly correlated is the text with the treatment, how strongly correlated is the text with the outcome. And then I'm going to combine those correlations in some way to get my treatment effect estimates. And it's going to be equivalent to finding A and controlling for A, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't use dimensionality reduction. And the way measuring correlations is not very hard. You can measure correlations by using the text to predict the treatment and using the text to predict the outcome and then measuring the prediction error. So that gives you a good measure of how correlated the treatment is with uh, the text and the outcome is with the text. So what does double machine learning give us? Double machine learning is, uh, it's not related to text. Uh, it's a general recipe that helps you use ML in uh, causal inference. And it takes care of two different types of biases. They call it regularization and overfitting bias. And it gives you something called root and convergence rates. And the way you, to interpret this is um, you need less data to get consistent estimates than if you did not have root and S convergence rates. Um, double machine learning lets us model this process, the causal process, as something called a partially linear regression model. This is the, what the model looks like. The rating depends on some count constant term multiplied by my uh, average treatment effect theta one times the treatment value, and then plus some un unobserved function of the text and an error term epsilon. So that's the um, okay. that's the partially linear regression model. And double machine learning tells you if this is my regression model, how do I go and estimate this from the data? And the estimation details are 
uh, that I'm going to skip over here. I'll just give you like a, a skim through and you can, I'll point you to another resource. So what double machine learning tells you is you have to construct a special equation. It's called a Neyman orthogonal moment condition. And that, it, it, that, uh, yeah, that equation looks like this. And um, the double machine learning tells you how to construct this uh, equation. Um, and the procedure is you construct this equation and then you estimate the equation from data. Uh, in practice, you don't, to solve this equation, you just have to run a couple of regressions. And those regressions are, you compute the prediction errors of the treatment and the prediction errors of the outcome from the text. So you have two prediction errors. And then you run a regression of the outcome prediction error on the treatment prediction error. That, that, uh, you run a linear regression. The important thing to keep in mind here is these prediction models of the treatment from the text and outcome from the text, they have to be trained on a separate sample of the data. And that's called sample splitting. And it's very important for the theory to work out well. And the, there, there's a bunch of nice theory that underlies this very simple procedure. Um, and you can look at Chris Felton's slides. They're linked in my slides and they're also linked on the tutorial website. All right, so those were, that's the high level overview of double ML. And now let me give you a demo of using double ML with uh, two different libraries. Uh, and then I will conclude the tutorial. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna regress the outcome on the treatment and the bag of words, but I'm gonna use double machine learning. I'm not gonna use linear regression. Uh, the first way I'm gonna do this is using something called the econ ML package. In the econ ML package, they have an estimator called the linear DML gate estimator, which, is, um, which maps to the partially linear model I showed you earlier. This library wants you to provide two models. What is the model of my outcome from the text? And what is the model of my treatment from the text? And I provided, I just say, I'm gonna use lasso with two fold cross validation. Um, and then this, remember I told you that your data has to be split, the training data, has to be a held out subset of the data. Um, that basically tells you, how do you make those splits? Uh, so when, you, when I say two splits, it means uh, split into two parts, train the prediction models on one part and then do the estimation on the other, and then flip things around, train the prediction model on the second part and do the estimation on the first part. That's, uh, that's what's happening here. And then I can just use a library I call fit and I ask for, um, the constant marginal effects of the treatment. And if you run this, this takes some time. Um, you'll see that your treatment effects are now less biased and your confidence interval now, it's wide. And this is an issue with running double MN. Confidence intervals become wide, um, but then it does overlap the true treatment effect. So this, was a, this is a library out of Microsoft, uh, which has been around for a while. There's a newer library that is by the authors of uh, the double ML paper, which I would recommend using going forward. It's called double ML. Um, and the way you set up the double ML uh, library is you first provide it the uh, data. You tell it what's the outcome, what's the treatment, and what is the high dimensional thing you're controlling for. And then very similar to econ ML, you provide what are the different predictors, the, the models that predict the outcome from the text and the treatment from the text. And then you create this estimator and um, uh, you can provide some parameters that I won't talk about now. And then you call estimator.fit. And you can see here that uh, it's the estimate is um, less, it's, it's slightly biased, but it's closer to 0 0.05. And in this case, the it doesn't actually overlap uh, the interval. Uh, you can usually fix that by making your cross validation better, maybe adding more folds so you get the right predictive models. Um, but in general, if you're using predictive models that are good, your um, conference interval should overlap the, the true treatment estimate. Um, and then finally, you can do this from scratch um, with one caveat, which I'll talk about in a bit. From scratch, you just need to do two things. You need to predict the treatment from the text and the outcome from the text and then run a regression of the prediction errors of the treatment on the prediction errors of the outcome. And that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm, first, I'm gonna split my data into two parts. Then I'm going to run these two models 
uh, of uh, prediction. Um, so you don't need the second model. You, you can just need the first model. I'm going to get the errors. And then this set of steps is basically running a regression. So it's, I'm just going to skip over it. It's just a way of manually running a regression. I'm instead going to go here. And you can see that I'm running an OLS regression of the outcome prediction error on the treatment prediction error. And that, again, gives me um, an effect size. And you can see the confidence intervals now overlap the uh, true treatment effect. The caveat here is different libraries compute these confidence intervals in different ways. Uh, which one is valid is something that you have to dig into the literature and uh, really think about. The double ML way implements a way of computing standard errors uh, the way the authors want to, but people do it in different uh, ways. So that's something you have to be careful about if you're doing it manually. You have to state that this is how you've done it and this is how you just obtain the standard errors. All right, so that, that um, ends the tutorial. Uh, in the, the rest of the slides are just um, like a wrap up and some alternate approaches that um, if you're if you're familiar with, I've given some comparison, uh, and there are, I pointed you to a few different resources that you can jump to after this tutorial. So I think we are over time, so I will uh, stop. At, oh yeah, topic number twenty-five. Yeah, I should have caught it. <laughs> so I will stop here, and uh, if people have to leave, they can leave. Cool. Yeah, I'll just stop recording.